In the last episode, Hashiba Hideyoshi further consolidated his power, cleaning up conflicts on the main island of Honshu while also launching a successful campaign to subjugate the Chosokabe clan of Shikoku. Eventually receiving the title of Kampaku and his new official family name, Toyotomi. Now, in this very same year, we turn to the east to witness a clash that is set to erupt between Tokugawa Ieyasu and his vassal, Sanada Masayuki. Following the death of Oda Nobunaga in 1582, we saw the eastern provinces burst into a chaotic period of contention, as the balance of power shifted and the Tokugawa, Hojo, and Uesugi fought over the former Oda-controlled territory. As I have previously discussed, this period was to be remembered as the Tensho Jingo Conflict, and although it was a climactic alteration of the situation east of the capital, it surprisingly came to an end without any major war breaking out. In order to usher in and maintain a new age of stability, Tokugawa Ieyasu, arguably the strongest lord of the east, had reinforced his relations with the mighty Hojo clan of Kanto, establishing bonds largely fortified through political marriage and territorial exchange. Yes, by 1585, peace was coming to reign throughout the region. A stark contrast to how the East had appeared just five years prior when the Takeda still existed, let alone 25 years prior when four powerful clans had all been working to assert their dominance. For now, only two great powers remained, and Ieyasu was set to ensure a steadfast coexistence. Prior to his bout with Toyotomi Hideyoshi the year before at Komaki and Nagakute, there was still some question yet regarding the future of the land and who would be the man to lead it into peace. Yet now, with the ending of the clash in Owari, Tokugawa Ieyasu had come out in a great position. Although it was not a decisive victory that may have paved the way to his acquisition of the central regime, it was still a triumph that showcased his prowess. Ieyasu now fully accepted Hideyoshi as the great power he was, and even though in time he would even swear allegiance to the Toyotomi, by 1585 it was clear that the two had come to an understanding of each other. Although they did not necessarily trust each other, they both understood the capabilities of one another, and had come to a series of agreements to strengthen the bonds between their clans, an obvious attempt to ensure future peace and stability. Thus, with his relationship with the Hojo and the Toyotomi secure, Ieyasu was set to focus solely on the well-being and growth of his domain, which actually was soon to face some internal conflict. Sanada Masayuki is one of the most fascinating figures of the Sengoku Jidai that we have touched on from time to time in the past. Previously, we witnessed after his brothers were slain at the Battle of Nagashino ten years prior, he became the head of the Sanada family. As a vassal of the ailing Takeda clan, Masayuki had desperately attempted to save the Takeda by requesting to shelter his lord, Takeda Katsuyori, in 1582. But it would all end up being in vain, as Katsuyori would let pride take the better of him and allow betrayal to lead to his death. The once legendary Takeda family had fallen to the overwhelming might of the Oda and Tokugawa as their forces poured across the border. Briefly, we saw the Oda establish dominance over the former Takeda provinces, and seeing no alternative, Masayuki would pledge himself to the Oda as well, quickly after Katsuyori's passing. This had caused him to lose ownership over Numata Castle, a stronghold he had secured in Kotsuke province, yet it also allowed him to keep his lands in Shinano, and more importantly, his head. And although the East was looking to be falling into a new era of peace, 
Eventually, things would fall apart only a few short months later, when Oda Nobunaga would be assassinated at Honoji. Following this, the Oda clan nearly shattered into pieces, causing the situation in the east to deteriorate into the period of chaos that was known as the Tensho Jingo conflict. Immediately, Masayuki had moved to retake Numata Castle in Kotsuke, while also allying himself to the Uesugi. However, when the Hojo were on the verge of bearing down upon him, he would switch sides to join them instead. Finally, as the Tokugawa had begun to push up into Shinano, Masayuki flipped sides for the final time and pledged himself to Ieyasu. Masayuki had masterfully executed a series of diplomatic and military maneuvers that not only saw him retake his former holdings, but also survive in the face of much larger powers. Being one of the stronger of the minor families in the east, he sat in a stable position under the Tokugawa. All looked bright for the Sanada, with sons Nobuyuki and Nobushige soon coming of age, strong-willed boys who would no doubt ensure the future of their family. In 1583, with the assistance of the Tokugawa, Masayuki was allowed to bolster his position in Shinano with the construction of his new castle at Ueda, a strong position that benefited from ideal defensive terrain. Implementing many of the newer modern castle features that had been influenced by Azuchi, Ueda would boast large stone walls, an impressive gate with robust overlooking towers, and a fine array of watchtowers and satellite forts that covered the surrounding area. This indeed was to be one of the greatest castles in Shinano province for its time. By 1585, we have already begun to see how Tokugawa Ieyasu had established a new period of stability in the east. Throughout a series of agreements, this peace was to be maintained. Yet, sometimes, things slip through the cracks. One agreement that was yet to be honored was that Numata Castle was to be handed over to the Hojo. Yet by 1585, Numata had yet to be given. In fact, the Sanada and Hojo for the past three years had been skirmishing all along their borders, as it was clear Masayuki was uninterested in letting the Hojo claim any of his territory. Finally, by the summer of that year, Ieyasu officially ordered Masayuki to relinquish control of the stronghold in aims to maintain a good relationship between himself and the Hojo. Having fought so hard for so long just to survive in this warring age, one might expect Masayuki to simply fall in line with his lord's command. Certainly, if it had been an order given by Takeda Shingen or Takeda Katsuyori, Masayuki would have done so. However, he did not view Ieyasu with the same level of respect. So no, Masayuki was not about to hand over Numata and refused Ieyasu's wishes. His argument in the matter was that Numata was not awarded to the Sanada by the Tokugawa, as it was a castle he had claimed while he was under the rule of the Takeda. Thus, the Tokugawa had no grounds in ordering it to be handed over to the Hojo. This, in all honesty, is a very legitimate argument. His defiance came as a complete shock to Ieyasu, who now viewed the Sanada as hostile rebels. Knowing he would soon be besieged by the Tokugawa and Hojo, Masayuki needed to act fast to guarantee any chance of survival. His largest hope laid in the hands of Daimyo Uesugi Kagekatsu of Ichigo, a lord whom Masayuki had previously pledged himself to. Sending word to Kagekatsu, Masayuki offered his son Nobushige as a political hostage in exchange for military assistance. Kagekatsu would agree. Thus, Nobushige, a boy who would later be remembered as Yukimura, would be sent north, while Uesugi armies departed to aid the Sanada. Masayuki himself, along with his eldest son, Nobuyuki, would stay to defend Ueda, while Masayuki's uncle, the prominent Sanada retainer, Yazawa Yoritsuna, would be positioned at Numata to hold off the Hojo. In July, Ieyasu would finally dispatch an army of 7,000 under the command of Tori Mototara and a number of other prominent lords to march up to subjugate Masayuki, who was only estimated to possess around 1,200 men. 
By August and into September, the Tokugawa army had amassed and begun their siege of Ueda and its surrounding satellite fortifications. And finally, by September 25th, we can see the Tokugawa forces begin to launch their first focused assault. As their massive force pushed past the satellite fort of Ueno and in towards Ueda's second bailey, it looked as if the castle would fall easy prey to the Tokugawa. However, as they stormed the position, they were soon met with a surprise Sanada counterattack. But even then, with the smaller Sanada force pitted against the much larger Tokugawa army, it still appeared like an easy victory. Although, this was all part of Masayuki's plan. The smaller Sanada force would draw the Tokugawa army deeper into the castle complex, allowing matchlock fire to begin inflicting heavy damage upon the attacking soldiers. Yet what really caught the Tokugawa forces off guard more so than the counterattack was when Masayuki signaled for Nobuyuki to unleash another attack from his position at the satellite fort of Toishi. Faced with not only stiff resistance from the castle, but now also an attack in the flank from forces under the command of Nobuyuki, the Tokugawa contingent quickly devolved into confusion and chaos, prompting them to begin a full retreat. Yet as they fled, Sanada forces chased after them and kept the pressure on, managing to whittle down a large portion of the attacking army. It is said that on this day, around 1300 Tokugawa soldiers were slain compared to only 40 that fell from the Sanada. Ueno showcased the stiff resistance the Tokugawa forces would face should they storm any other part of the Ueda defensive network. All round, the Tokugawa were seemingly set to fall into a long, hard period of sieges in order to uproot the Sanada, a position no leader would want. And when news began to spread of even more Uesugi reinforcements marching south, Ieyasu knew he needed to lay on the pressure more so than ever before, as he would send I Naomasa at the head of an additional 5,000 men to aid in finishing the fight. On the Numara front, the Hojo were also facing difficulties, as Yoritsuna's defensive measures were managing to hold the armies of Kanto at bay as well. It was becoming apparent that Masayuki's gamble was paying off, as his forces, aided by the Uesugi, were proving successful against their much larger adversaries. By October, as I Naomasa drew near Ueda with reinforcements, a general withdrawal was called for the Tokugawa in aims to reorganize their offensive. Yet, as Tokugawa forces began to pull back, something would happen that would completely shatter their efforts. Ishikawa Kazumasa, an integral part of the Tokugawa army, deserted Ieyasu. Kazumasa had long been a loyal retainer of the Tokugawa and had served Ieyasu since his youth, but over time he had become outraged at Ieyasu's leadership. From taking great risks at battles such as Mikatagahara and Komaki Nakakute, to now being defied and held back at Ueda, Kazumasa had begun to view Ieyasu as senseless. This eventually caused Kazumasa to leave Ieyasu's service in exchange for the Toyotomi. With Kazumasa's departure, the Tokugawa war effort fell into a state of disarray. All the time Masayuki needed to bring an end to the conflict. By December, with the Tokugawa and Hojo firmly held back by the Sanada, Masayuki began making petitions to Hideyoshi, which would lead to him too becoming directly involved in the conflict as he would respond swiftly to Masayuki's pleas. Immediately, military action was to cease, as the Sanada would be brought under the wing of the Toyotomi clan. The Tokugawa and Hojo would have no other choice than to back off. Sanada Masayuki had essentially won. And although this defeat was a great embarrassment to Ieyasu, it is also said that he would commend Masayuki for his skill in the strategic defense of Ueda. The Hojo too would be scorned, for they would not receive Numata, a castle they strongly believed was theirs. This would be the start of an uneasy tension that was set to rise between them and the Toyotomi. With the Sanada now formally in service to Hideyoshi, Nobushige would be allowed to leave Ichigo. However, he would soon be sent to Osaka, where he would be made to more directly serve the Toyotomi. As in time, he would be wed to Chikurinin, 
the daughter of the prominent Toyotomi retainer Otani Yoshitsugu. In terms of his brother Nobuyuki, he too would be used for a political marriage. In aims to strengthen the ties between the Sanada and Tokugawa following the siege of Ueda, Nobuyuki would be wed to Komatsuhime, the daughter of Honda Tarakatsu and adopted daughter of Ieyasu. These marriages would go far to elevate the position of Masayuki and the Sanada family, as now, both of his sons were wed into two of the most powerful clans in the entire country. And thus, it is easy to see at this very moment that, in time, their paths would come to play a major role in the outcome of the period. So, what can we learn? In 1585, Tokugawa Ieyasu had established a period of stability in the East, cemented by alliances between himself, the Toyotomi, and the Hojo. However, these alliances came with agreements, agreements that Ieyasu had to maintain. One such pact was the handing over of Numata Castle in Kotsuke Province, a stronghold held by Sanada Masayuki, a skilled strategist and former Takeda retainer. In the summer of 1585, Ieyasu would order Masayuki to relinquish Numata to the Hojo, yet he would refuse and immediately seek aid from the Uesugi. This prompted a siege on both Numata and the newly constructed castle of Ueda. Yet even though Masayuki was vastly outnumbered, he was still able to hold the Tokugawa and Hojo at bay, long enough to secure support from Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who would bring an end to the conflict. In the aftermath, Masayuki's sons Nobuyuki and Nobushige would be wed into both the Tokugawa and Toyotomi clans, placing Masayuki atop a very important dynasty. In the next episode, Hideyoshi will begin his conquest of the island of Kyushu, where Toyotomi forces will face fierce resistance from the mighty Shimazu clan. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.